Yeah, I've been uh, working with a team of researchers at the University of Toronto for uh, about two years now. And see if I can get this to work here. Yes, um, we have been concentrating on um, animation, character animation, and in particular, the really what to us is the most important part of that, which is the human face. Um, in any, if you look at any given movie, for example, you'll see probably about 70 to 80 percent of the shots being close up of human face. And in animated films, getting that human face right, whether it's a human character or a human like character, is will either make or break your belie believing in the film. And often that uh, is a difficult task where filmmakers actually fail to do that. And uh, so, uh, uh, so intense is our acuity in seeing human faces that, for example, I'm going to give you a pop quiz here. Two faces here. One of them belongs to uh, the 44th President of the United States, Barack Hussein Obama. Uh, raise your, I'm going to see if I can look at you here. Raise your left hand if you think it's the guy on the left, your right hand if you think it's the guy on the right. Okay, so I'm looking, okay. Um, so I'm seeing pretty much all right hands, and they all went up pretty quickly. Uh, so yeah, you're correct. That is Barack Hussein Obama on the right. The guy on the left, this fellow named Louis Ortiz, otherwise known as Bronx Obama. <laughs> if you uh, go to the New York Times website and type in his name, you will see a documentary on uh, Louis Ortiz. Uh, he's famous, uh, obviously more famous when uh, Obama was president, as being the guy, the go-to guy of any guy in the world who looks like Barack Obama. Now think about that. There are seven billion people on this planet and this guy, this one guy here, Luis Ortiz, is the guy who looks the most like Barack Obama. And yet, I saw right hands go up within a half a second of my asking that question. What is it that separates or distinguishes Luis Ortiz from Barack Obama? I think you would be kind of hard pressed to tell me the actual differences, but instinctively, you knew the difference. And this is a testimonial to our ability to a part of our brain which is dedicated from birth to being able to distinguish one face from another, a familiar person from a stranger, or one expression from another. And when you're an animator, you totally have to get that right. And if you fail to get it right, even by a little bit, you fall into this thing that's called the uncanny valley. So the uncanny valley is a two-dimensional graph in which, well, horizontal axis is realistic, vertical axis is trustworthy. You would like to think that those things are interrelated, that they go hand in hand. For example, if you take uh, a very simple character who's not very realistic, like say this guy. I said I'm gonna punish you and come hell or high water, I... Wait a minute. <gasps> Ice cream truck! Okay, so this dude is very simply drawn. He's not very realistic. And, you know, he can, you, he can star in The Simpsons and tell some really simple, funny stories. And, uh, yeah, we buy him on that level. Uh, going further to the right, we can get a little more complex. Run! Run away! Hi! In the woods, anywhere! Never come back! Now go! <gasps> okay, Snow White is literally more fleshed out. She's got really great human-like gestures, simple and stylized, but we can tell more complex stories with Snow White. Then we can get even more complex, going further to the right. School was great, all right? Riley, is everything okay? <gasps> so yeah, that's Pixar, film inside out. And yeah, you, what you see there is a realistic shader or texture on, the per, on her skin, Riley's skin. You see really sheeny hair, it looks realistic, and you see uh, uh, expression. She does that eye roll, and that's what we humans do, and Pixar has made an incredible reputation of being not just realistic, but believable. So let's skip ahead to the all complete, all, all the way over to the right, and we see absolute realism, like this dude. I'm totally real and totally human. You can trust me. Yeah, totally trustworthy, right? Because he's got real skin, and he's totally real, right? But between the Pixar character and the dude on the right, there's this weird phenomena that happens in which characters are so realistic that they mimic reality, but they're not quite real. Like this thing. 
You like zombies? Zombies eat brains? Mom, no one likes zombies. They're an abomination. I am a social companion. I can speak of emotions and I can recognize people. She's singing, I feel fantastic, hey, hey, hey. That was, that was a, vi a, a video that went viral a few years ago, and you know, it's kind of terrifying, right? So I mean, it kind of fits into what Steve was talking about earlier. These characters are human-like, but you don't really get the impression that they've got an imagination, that they've got creativity in any real sense that Steve was trying to sort of expose us to here. And that's the problem, that there's realism without reality. And it, takes away trust and believability. And where that really happens, uh, where that trust gets, uh, gets um, compromised, is with speech. Because speech ha carries a lot of the emotion and a lot of the intelligence and the imagination that we as humans show when we're expressing ourselves through words. Now, what will sometimes happen, what researchers have been working on has been a realistic kind of speech that can be generated and put onto CGI characters, whether through artificially intelligent derived uh, speech generation or through an actor actually voicing these words. And we've come a fair amount uh, on this, but we have not achieved the kind of believability that I would like to see, and that I think that would be shared with other people who are dealing with these characters. This what I'm going to show you here is kind of state of the art. Sono una faccia parlante molto giovane e carina. Posso essere davvero molto triste, ma anche davvero spaventata. With voice matic create quality lip sync in a snap. Okay, so there's, yeah, certainly the semblance and of, of uh, speech and those characters are properly articulating, but one can see that it's not really quite there. And the reason it's not quite there is because we as human beings have a great deal of complexity in our faces, in the machinery of our faces, that allow us to do some pretty nuanced and very precise stuff with our lips and our jaws that gives the human-like quality to speech. So one of the things that I do is to uh, teach about uh, the mach that machinery of the face and how that ties in to the psychology behind the face. So I do a master class uh, called Making Faces. I was just in Sweden teaching this last week. I'm going to bring you through like two seconds of what is otherwise a one-week course. We're made up of muscles, and our faces in particular have uh, dozens of these very intricately interconnected muscles. Uh, when we smile, as this character is doing here, we're using two of those muscles on either side of our cheeks. They're called zygomatic major muscles. But that is, as a basic smile, kind of putting her into the uncanny valley. It's a little bit creepy. In order for a smile to have the kind of nuances that human beings have, you've got to add a bunch of other muscles. For example, muscle controlling the pushing on the uh, lower eyelids of your eyes is what gives a sense of that she's actually smiling through her whole head, not just her mouth. You can add a bunch of other muscles, uh, like going through lower lip muscles. Now she's grinning. We can add a little bit of upper lip muscle. Now she's kind of more genuinely grinning. We can add subtext to her face through these other muscles, like in her neck and the sides of her jaw. Um, and then you start to see that a simple smile can become kind of a symphony of different expressions, depending on this nuanced interaction of other muscles. So with speech, you have about 15 or 16 pairs of muscles that are interacting with each other. And in order to be able to t show that, you have to have a knowledge of anatomy in addition to uh, a knowledge of psychology, what I call the anatomy of emotion. So here, sorry, I'm going to go back, back here. So here, we are doing research, here being the dynamic graphics project at the University of Toronto on this. It's called Jolly Jaw and Lip Integration. And what this involves is this very intricate, what we're doing here is simulating some pretty intricate connection between the way that we use our lips and our jaws, okay? So lips meaning facial muscles, jaw meaning that bone called the mandible that goes up and down. So I'll show you a little bit of the difference between those two. There should be a video coming up right two seconds here. 
Okay, what you're looking at is a traditional way of uh, animating. The animators would take a particular sound, ah, eh, s, p, and so on. Those are little bits there are, are called phonemes. And what you do if you're animating is you map those phonemes to visemes. That can work in basic, like that Homer Simpson kind of animation, but if you apply it to a realistic animation, it's not going to work. Five different ways of saying a phoneme called oh, all right? Um, that is the way that we talk. We, depending on our mood, our psychology, our speaking style, we're going to be using uh, different variations and of lips and jaw. And I'm still redneck. This guy. I boat, fish, hunt, whatever the fuck I want to do. He's using his jaw and not his lips. This person. Robert Wilson, Piergent, Jerry Zachs, the Cane Mutiny Court Martial. She's using her lips without really using her jaw. This is a kind of two-dimensional field, which we call the jolly field, jaw and lip, in which in that field you have different speaking styles. And if you've ever heard a telemarker on the phone, you know that that person is, sounds artificially cheerful, and she sounds, or he or she sounds artificially cheerful because she's smiling as she's talking, and when you hear the voice without seeing the person, you can tell that. Now, what if we can glean that emotion or that speaking state automatically, if we can glean that from only the signal of a person talking, then we can give animation to a face, to a character, that's got some actual humanity to it. So that's what we do here. We're taking a character, a CG character, and we're adding that two-dimensional feel that you were seeing before, and we're moving that around. She's saying one phoneme, ah, but she's saying it all these different ways, depending on where we put that, what we call the jolly joystick, okay? So this is how the sort of the cornerstone of how we're simulating speech. So uh, what I'll show you here is kind of a real-time demonstration of that, in which a, a, a person will the speak a mercy. line. From the Merchant of Venice, Act Four, Scene One, by William Shakespeare, recorded for LibriVox.org by Kirsten Ferreri. That line's turned into text. There you see it there. The text file is saved out along with that audio file. It's read into Maya, computer animation program. And then there is a uh, machine learning, for, what's called forced alignment done. Quality of Mercy, from The Merchant of Venice, Act 4, Scene 1, by William Shakespeare. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Kirsten Ferreri. And that process, I call it forced alignment, times the speech with uh, the character and with the actress, and given the quality of the, uh, the emotional tone in the, that audio signal, that, char that character you saw there can talk with a fair degree of believability, we think, believability, some humanity, and emotion, and expression. And that is where we start to hopefully bridge that uncanny valley and to give a sense of real humanity even if the character is not real. So I'm going to try a little test here. We have a voice actress uh, named Patrice Goodman, and she has recorded 30 seconds of dialogue, and you're going to see three variations of that head, okay, that you just saw before, speaking. One of them is motion capture, it's performance capture, where we're literally taking Patrice's uh, facial features and mapping them to a character, performance capture. One is keyframe animation, the way that an animator from Walt Disney, Max Fleischer today would have done it. And one of them is automated jolly uh, speech lip sync. And I'd like you to put up one finger if you think that the automated one is the one on the left, two fingers if it's the middle, and three fingers if it's the one on the right. Here goes. My mom never hugged me. I even went back east a couple of weeks before she died just to get her to hug me. And I sat there for like three days and it was very frustrating watching her second guess the answers on Jeopardy while she dunked her tea biscuits into her tea. And after about three days, I couldn't take it. I got up, I walked over, and I hugged her. Okay, so yeah, one finger if you think the automated one's on the left, two if it, you think it's the middle, and three if it's on the right. I see one, two, three, two, one, three. There are, you guys are like statistically all over the place. And when I see that statistically all over the place, it means that, that for the most part, in large, you guys don't have any idea which is which. 
So yeah, uh, it's, it turns out it is the one on the right that is, uh, that is completely automated speech. So it's, I mean, it's the first time I've actually tried doing this with, a, with an audience, so that's kind of good and telling. It's a bit of a Turing test, a very small scale version of a Turing test here. But yeah, through machine learned automated lip sync, we're able to get some degree of humanity in our computer graphics characters. And that is a big endeavor of ours here at University of Toronto to get past that gap in the uncanny valley, to bring those characters to a place where we, you, can have some degree of trust. It is about trust. So yeah, that's what I've got to say. Thank you very, very much.